Okay, this is gonna be an unusual lesson. We're gonna cover two topics that seem completely polar opposite, and I'm gonna need you to listen to me. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. It scared me, I'm just gonna tell you, first half won't be scary, second half maybe a little bit frightening. <laughs> so anyway, but um, I love that a diamond and an adamant, when they used to be called the same, is a symbol of love. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get engaged, I remember when Addison was like, you were in, you know, in your prison of internship. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever. It was kind of an, it was kind of an unusual and <laughs> intensity. And Addison was like shopping for your diamond and John yeah. by accident threw it away. And, <laughs> and we were like, oh my gosh. But it was just so important to him that you get something that is just what you wanted. Because mm -hmm. he wanted to say, I love you and I love you big. And he got Julie a diamond that you don't even have to upgrade. But um, anyway, <laughs> I love that love is supposed to be radiant, mm -hmm. that it's supposed to reflect light, that it's supposed to be something that stands the test of time. Yeah. But I want to talk first about God. You know, God doesn't have love. God mm -hmm. is love. It's actually his very nature. He doesn't love us because he has to, because Jesus died for us. He actually loves us because he cannot not love us. He wow. loves us. He created us. He loved you before you were born. You were his idea. You weren't your parents' idea. You were woven in a womb of wonder and of love. And I don't know what your circumstances were around your birth. I don't know if you feel like that's not true. It's true. And so I need you to have a revelation that God is love and God is not love for you. He is love. He is just Love, that's who he is, and that's how he sees you. He sees you through love. We talked about hovering. We talked about that tender, gentle, adamant, intimate God. But we're going to talk about love. He's adamant in love. His love is invincible. Let me just tell you something. You cannot stop him mm -hmm. from loving you. That's right. You cannot stop him. His love for you is not dependent on your behavior. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. It has nothing to do with your behavior. It has yeah. everything to do that he set his love on you before you ever turned your face to him. Mm -hmm. God is not moved by your unlovely behavior. It's not that he's not aware. It's just that he is impervious to our awful. His love is invincible and God is our first love. Mm -hmm. He will always be our first love. And the truth is that's because he first loved us. I, I love, again, going back to the Exodus, going back to the Deuteronomy, going back to the imagery, Exodus 15 says, you have led them in your steadfast love. Not in their, Israel was up and down all the time. You have led them in your steadfast love. The people, and that's you, the people whom you have redeemed, you have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Do you see that God leads us with love mm -hmm. to bring us home? Yes. His holy abode is not a church building. Mm -hmm. It is always about bringing us to himself. Yeah. God delivered them so that he could reveal his love to them in the wilderness. His love for us, not dependent on us. His love for us, is not according to our behavior. I need you to hear these things. He has always loved us. He loves you now and he will always love you. Do you understand even if a person says, I'm sorry, I don't want anything to do with Jesus and I, I want to go to hell. God would still love that person. The redemption thing has nothing to do with his love for you. He doesn't love you once you became a Christian. He has always loved you. We can't earn what we've never deserved. And you can't keep it by being good now. Right. His love for you is invincible, immovable, and constant. And because of that, you should be wrapped in a covenant of peace. Remember, will not make haste, be at mm -hmm. peace, be at peace. Yeah. Juliana's middle name, Juliana Peace. So she's like, always oh, that. But he <laughs> is the God who seals us. And it's interesting, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. This is from the ESV. It says, it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our heart as a guarantee. I cannot establish myself mm 
Right. You cannot establish yourself. Going to a church does not establish you. Now, that builds you up in the faith, being part of a community of believers, but it doesn't establish you. We cannot, through our own works, establish us. God knew that, so he did it. I love how the Passion Translation treats this in exact same verse. It says, now it is God himself who has anointed us. Do you know what that means? That means he's actually marked you for himself. He has anointed us and he has He is constantly strengthening both you and us in union with Christ. He knows that we are his since he stamped his seal of love over our hearts and has given us the Holy Spirit like an engagement ring. Mm -hmm. I love that. Like an engagement ring is given to a bride, a down payment for blessings to come. Mm -hmm. He gave you his spirit as a down payment for the blessings to come. You have been sealed. You are born of the spirit, sealed with the spirit, indwelled by the spirit, baptized in the spirit, made one in the spirit and given gifts by the spirit. Do you understand that everything that happens is by and through the Holy Spirit? I don't know where you are in your life, but if you're like, I'm not sure if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, ask him, ask him. He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. It's not scary. It's not weird. It's how God seals us. It's how he interacts with it. We are commissioned into the ministry of reconciliation. It doesn't mean a platform. Ministry of reconciliation is how you live your life by the spirit. And everything we need was provided by God who loves us without end, again, by his spirit. Ephesians 1 verse 2 says, I am writing this letter to all the devoted believers who have been made holy by being one with Jesus, the anointed one. May God himself, the heavenly father of our Lord Jesus, release grace over you and impart total well-being into your lives. Hear me, lovely one. You do not inhabit a like temporary place. You have had cascading grace poured over your life. Mm-hmm. But I want to tell you, there is somebody that hates you. Mm. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's the prince of the power of the air. Mm-hmm. Yep. He has no love for you. Mm-hmm. Any gift that he promises you will turn out to be a theft. Yeah. Any power that he says is now yours is attached to a realm that is destined to crumble and fail. He cannot help but pervert everything he touches. Mm. And we live in a time and an age where there is so much confusion about what love really is. That's right. God's not only adamant in love with us, he's adamant that we actually love each other. The Bible is so clear that they're going to know we're Christians by our That's love right. one yeah. for another. Yeah. Yes. And we have not done this well. We've got great music. We've got beautiful buildings. We've got smoke machines. We've got the best lights, but we are still not loving one another well. And if you say, I'm not sure if that's right, just go to social media. Mm-hmm. Just go to social media. Come we on. are not loving one another well. Yeah. But people who love well, live well. I had, uh, I've already mentioned to you, a very strained relationship with my mom. And that right before she died, I, I really had a revelation that I had been in a better place to love her than she had been to love me. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's so funny. She's been gone now. She's in heaven for over two years. And I don't even remember what we thought about. Mm-hmm. But I do regret all the kind words I didn't say. You will never regret kindness. You will never regret loving someone. But you will regret a lost opportunity. Now, I have eternity to soften that blow. But I'm just going to make sure that you hear me. You got to own your mistakes. Because when you own your mistakes... They no longer own you. And so I had to take responsibility. I couldn't just keep saying, well, she didn't do this and she didn't do this. I said, I could have done that. Mm -hmm. I could have done that. God is adamant that we love one another. That means we love people that are different than us. That means we love people that look different than us, think different than us, people that we disagree with. Mm -hmm. We still have to love them. Do you know a lot of people that you see right now as enemies are really just people desperate? Mm-hmm. to be loved. That's yes. right. And we need to move beyond all of the division and all of the confusion and all of the divisive spirit that the prince of the power of the air, the accuser of brethren, hello, if you're attacking people, you're being used by Satan. Seriously. Yeah. We need to move beyond all of that and begin to love well. Yeah. See, we need to love fearlessly because love has no fear. Yes. We need to love so selflessly 
because love is not selfish. We need to love free of offense because love keeps no record of wrongs. We need to love triumphantly. Why? Because love cannot fail. And we need to love endlessly because love is eternal. And so we have to be people who receive the love of God and then give the love of God. But I want to talk to you about this scary part of the message. This God who is adamant in love is also adamant in hate. I know you're like, wait, wait, how, how, can, how can God who is love hate? Yeah, that was my reaction. I was just finishing up the chapters in adamant about adamant in love and adamant that we love when I heard the Holy Spirit, I closed my, closed my laptop, I heard the Holy Spirit say, and yet I'm adamant and hate. And I was like, wait, wait, no, 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 no. And then I remembered Proverbs 6, 6, where God says, six things do I hate and seven is an abomination. I was like, okay, so what did I do? I just copied, pasted, started a new document, adamant and hate, and was like, I'll just, I'll just look at that tomorrow. Got home. We were actually all vacationing in Florida. There's like 11 people in a house. So that's why I had to ride my bike somewhere else to ride. And, um, and I had a text message, again, from my sweet rabbi, Ryan. This is your, all of this is you. Anyway, and, and he said, what? He said, the Holy Spirit said that you're writing. Well, I didn't tell him I was writing. I was supposed to be on vacation with my family. He said, the Holy Spirit told me that you're writing. And he said, whatever you have landed on today, you need to pursue that. He said, it is the reason why an entire generation has been immunized against truth. Wow. So I wrote him back. I was like, Adam and hate? <laughs> I was a like, question mark. And he wrote me back all these different like mm. Hebrew words that I don't know how to pronounce or <laughs> spell. Anyway, so and I was like, okay. So, so the next day, you know, I just kind of put it aside. I remember I shared it with Julia. I was like, what? We read the text and then I like went on with my day. And then the next day I went back to this little carriage house above somebody's garage where I was writing. And I was like, God, I, I need you to talk to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's one thing to have Rabbi, Rabbi Brian text. That's awesome. <laughs> but I need you to talk to me. I need you to talk to me. How can you hate? Yeah. How can you who are love hate? And this is as fast as I could put pen to paper. He began to unpack it to me. He said, Lisa, I hate what unmakes love. Mm -hmm. He said, I hate what unmakes love those I love. He said, I hate what undermines my image and distorts yours. And so I was like, okay. So in short, our father hates what corrupts love. Mm -hmm. God loves people. So we're going to make that really clear. People are not what God hates. God loves people. God loves the broken. God loves the bound. God loves the sinner. God is love. And love never hates people because people are what God loves. God loves everyone, but God does not love everything. Do you yeah. hear me? Yes. God loves everyone, but he does not love everyone everything. And we talked about the Genesis. We talked about this beautiful creation, but how many of you know, we do not walk the earth where everything is good anymore. We walk the earth in a season where everything is crying out for a revelation of the sons and daughters of God and the restoration of truth and justice. So I'm going to ask you a question because I really believe that our culture has idolized love yeah. mm -hmm. and in the process called love mm -hmm. a lot of things that aren't love. Mm -hmm. So we have actually said God is love, mm -hmm. but we've actually kind of lived love is God. See, yeah. God is love, but love is not God. Mm -hmm. And you can't worship love outside of the character and the parameters of God. So Romans 8.39 says... It says that, you know, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. See, all of this happens in the cornerstone, in the adamant, in Christ Jesus. Nothing, it's impervious, nothing can separate you. But danger arises when we separate love from the parameters of a God who is love. First John 4, 8, God is love. And then we hear in Hebrews 12, 29, God is a consuming fire. Yeah. So he is love. And he is a consuming fire. And then the book of Acts 17, 28, it says, in him we live and move and have our being. And when you put those three together, it is not impossible to put the connection of we live in a consuming fire of God's love. 
Love is always going to go after what unmakes us. Yes. God is right. always wow. going to go after in his love for us what undermines our relationship mm -hmm. with him. Yes. And yeah. so we have to understand just as we have maybe not understood the definition of love, that maybe we haven't understood the definition of hate. You know, when I was writing this, all I could think of was the race hate crimes and, you know, the horrible things happening to women. And I, like, whenever I hear the word hate, I hear crime, I hear hate, I hear crime. But let's separate the word hate from our experiences with it. And let's actually just look at the definition of the word hate. Again, going through the scriptures, I'm going to unpack what God hates. He hates everything that undermines justice and truth. Mm -hmm. When widows, orphans, and aliens are oppressed, God hates that. The abuse of the elderly and the neglect of family, God hates it. He hates what perverts his goodness and taints his gifts. He hates it when love is twisted into selfishness and friends become enemies. He hates what changes his image and distorts ours because when the image of God changes, it can't help but mm -hmm. distort our image of him and our image of ourselves. He hates it when evil is called good and the innocent are killed yeah. and arrogance and pride degrade us. God hates all that undermines love for everything that undermines love debases us. Mm. You were made for love. Yes. You are made for God. So I was shocked when I was going through my scriptures and I began to look at my different uh, logo software. I found over 3,000 words that gave scriptural uh, context for the things that God hated. And I, there was just ridiculous amount. My editor was like, we're going to put it in the back of the book. So it's like in the back of this book and we're not going to reference all this. But when I began to look at this, I realized that everything God hates is about protecting what he loves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And why should I have been surprised by that? You know, as right. parents, as parents, we, we would hate what would cause our children to be at risk. And so right. we need to understand God is a perfect parent. Yeah. So yeah. I want to talk to you about things. First of all, I'm going to talk about something I hate personally. I, I hate snakes. I hate, yes. I hate snakes. And when I was even writing the book, I have a machete on top. I know this is ridiculous. I have a machete on top of the hutch, just in case there's a snake in the basement. I'm like, there's something about having my desk under, like in the dark with my legs under yeah. it. I'm like, if there's a snake, makes sense. I'm going to have to kill it. I'm going to have to kill it and I have to have a machete because it's just, it's just, I'm going to have one strike or if it moves, I'll freak out. <laughs> I hate, I hate snakes. If there was a snake in the house and I had other people around, I'd get them to kill it. But if there's no one in the house, right. I'm going to have to take it out. Yeah. I'm going to have to take it out. There's a lot of people that are saying, oh, I hate injustice. Oh, I hate sex trafficking. Really? Do you hate pornography the way you hate sex trafficking? Mm -hmm. Because I talk to a lot of people that think it's okay to be entertained by something that's actually the catalyst mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of sex trafficking. So, yeah. so we have to understand what Charles Spurgeon meant when he said, you cannot love what God loves, people, if you do not hate what God hates, the things that put them in bondage. So I'm going to ask you to be able to understand the separation of this. We're going to close with this scripture so you don't think I'm just making all this up. But I have, a, you've got in the book this whole list of what God hates. But Romans 12, 9 says, let love, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. We cannot even have genuine love if we love everything. That's ingenuous. Yeah. You can't love everything. You can't do that. Yeah. You have to love what God loves, and you have to hate what God hates. So I'm going to go through these super quick. God hates pride. Why does he hate pride? Because pride is the only thing that sets us in opposition to him. Yeah. Pride becomes a barrier between us and God. God hates lying. Why? Because it's practice of Satan. Satan is the father of lies, and God is true. So he hates lying because, again, it undermines it. God hates innocent bloodshed. And in the book, I talk about what that looks like, but it is somebody who actually is going after somebody that cannot protect themselves, hearts that devise wicked plans. Why does he hate that? Because God has a plan for your life. Yeah. It's planned for good and not harm. And when you right. plan bad for somebody else, you're going against yeah. God's will. Right. He hates feet that run quick to evil. That's people that are actually like really proud and gloating about what they got away with. He hates divorce. I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't hate people that get divorced. But do you know God said he hates divorce because it overwhelms a woman 
with cruelty. And God is a faithful husband. And so he didn't want his daughters overwhelmed with cruelty and rejection. God hates it when we're false witnesses. What does that mean? It means to lie under oath. Because when you take an oath, you're not just lying to people, you're lying to God. God hates discord sown among the brethren. He hates sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry. He hates greed. Let's talk about this. He hates greed. Oh, we all jump on the sexual immorality things, but God hates Mm -hmm. idolatry Mm -hmm. and greed and strife. He hates double standards of hypocrisy and criticism when we hold other people at this standard and then we have a lower standard of our own. And I'm just going to close out with this. When I was looking at these standards of hypocrisy, I realized that I actually had hypocrisy in my own life Mm -hmm. because sometimes I would rather tell people what they wanted to hear Mm -hmm. than to be part of their rescue. Mm -hmm. It is not loving to lie to people and call things that are evil good. It is not loving to say that all things are approved by God. We need to be people who rightly discern the word of God. We cannot be divisive women, but we have to be women who Rightly divide the word of God. And hating evil is not permission to hate people. We're Christians. We're not terrorists. We are not people who are going to be mean-spirited. We are anointed to overcome evil with good. There is so much in this. But I'm just going to tell you, rather than hate what's out there, I'm going to challenge you as my sister to hate what's in here. Hate hypocrisy. Hate the... The false, hate the slander, hate, hate whatever it is. Don't, don't flirt with it. Mm. Don't wink at it. Don't watch pornography. I know that it's hard to almost escape it nowadays, but don't intentionally watch these things that debase people made in the image of God. So we have to be people who say, we're going to actually make this shift. Charles Spurgeon, I love this. He said, he said, we are bound to love our enemies. We love our enemies. That's people. But we are not bound to love the enemies of God. So I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit is going to give you wisdom and discernment and direction so that you can love what God loves and hate what he hates so that your love will be genuine in Jesus' name.